Hello and welcome to Maulana Azad National Urdu University's Global Classroom. Today's lesson is meant specifically for the second year MA English students. This particular lesson is based on the compulsory paper, paper 5, Literary Criticism and Theory and is taken from Unit 4, Block 8. The title, as you are aware, is Post-Colonial Theory. Those of you who have already read this particular paper from the self-instructional material sent to you, I am sure you have started reading straight from Aristotle's Poetics to the various blocks and by the time you have come to block 8, I am sure you have also realized that in the later half of the 20th century, uh, several uh, disciplines have influenced literary criticism and theory. Disciplines like linguistics, philosophy, Marxism and psychoanalysis. One such theory that was influenced in the later half of the 20th century is post-colonial theory. And to talk to you today about post-colonial theory, we have with us Professor Sayyid Mujibuddin. Professor Mujibuddin is Professor of English, Department of English, Hyderabad Central University. He was also associated with the Kakatiya University. Professor Mujibuddin did his PhD from the University of Kent, UK. His areas of specialization are Indian English fiction, Shakespeare studies, Victorian literature and 20th century English literature and of course not to forget post-colonialism. Therefore, we will now turn our attention to Professor Mujibuddin and ask him what is it that we understand by post-colonialism. The term post-colonialism refers to the social, political, economic and cultural practices which arise in response and resistance to colonialism. It is not a naive chronological sequence uh, which supersedes colonialism as the name implies, but is rather an engagement uh, with and contestation of colonialism's discourses, power structures. Uh, and social hierarchies. It also assumes an inevitable connection with the mother country, the metropolitan center that renders all cultural output emanating out of this connection, this writing back to the center necessarily hybrid and syncretic. Uh, Sir, will you please expand on this notion of hybridity? The dynamic hybridity that uh, critics like Homi Bhabha for example, have suggested to us actually uh, emanate from uh, the works of Salman Rushdie, for example, mm -hmm. whose Midnight Children uh, is an example, a very good example mm -hmm. of uh, how uh, hybridity works in post colonial literary theory uh, uh, and criticism. Uh, we will find, we find here in Midnight Children, for example, that the hero, the, you know, Salim Sinai. Uh, is actually uh, a bastard son uh, born uh, to actually uh, an Englishman and a gypsy girl, but you know born and brought up in a Muslim family uh, who uh, because he was born into that family is actually replaces another Hindu son you know the, the actual Muslim son who should have, should have been there he replaces that son and as a matter of fact, usurps uh, that place. So, that image of usurpation that occurs in Midnight Children uh, uh, becomes the symbol of also the kind of hybridity that Sal Salim Sinai actually symbolizes all through the book. So, he is not just uh, uh, you know Muslim in that sense, but also Hindu and Christian and also tribal. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, this hybridity, this, this plurality of India is actually what is reflected in Salim Sinai's character. In fact, you know, entire structure of the book as well, because it's uh, you know, Rajdi has spoken about how uh, he has been influenced by various forms of uh, uh, literature. Mm -hmm. uh, he has, for example, talked about uh, how the Tindrum, uh, you know, the, the German novel, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, influenced his work. But he's also acknowledged the fact that you know, it's the Indian storytelling form, the oral form, which has influenced his work. So it is. Uh, a lot of influences that come together on Salman Rushdie's work and uh, you know in and pronounce its hybridity mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. You have seen how the notion of hybridity works in Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children and if some of you have opted for this text 
you can now go ahead and apply psycho or post colonial theory to a study of midnight's children sir may now now ask you about some more examples of post colonial literature those literatures which have a connection with uh, the mother country as i have just explained especially england so in this connection uh, the most of the literature that comes to mind is from not just india as we have seen uh, as we have just discussed midnight children but they also come from countries like uh, canada australia new zealand uh, these are the uh, kind of first world mm -hmm. countries as a matter of fact and then there are other countries which we can classify as third world countries mm -hmm. like africa for example mm -hmm. where uh, people like chinua achebe mm -hmm. uh, and his book classical uh, things fall apart for example uh, is an example of how post colonial mm -hmm. literature works and then also uh, you have uh, west indies okay mm -hmm. the literature coming from the mm -hmm. west indies the caribbean you know people like george lamming mm -hmm. you know derek welcott yeah. and then v s nepal all of these writers uh, are considered to be post colonial mm -hmm. uh, by a book like for example mm -hmm. empire rides back mm -hmm. you know uh, which in itself has faced a lot of criticism in recent times for various reasons which we, mm -hmm. i think we'll come back to that when we are you know uh, looking at uh, different questions uh, so you have uh, uh, post colonial literature coming from a host of range of countries uh, from a host of different countries as mm -hmm. a matter of fact where uh, you will find that you know it offers us uh, a, a, a uh, interesting uh, variety uh, of different kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, literary experiences mm -hmm. okay uh, for example uh, you will find that in canada you have a lot of literature uh, that is uh, actually also writing back to england mm -hmm. but in ways which are different from what say an indian writer is writing back mm -hmm. to the uh, english center okay so i think uh, uh, these are complex questions mm -hmm. as a matter of fact uh, and you would need to perhaps look at each country and its literature uh, to see how you know each country has its own specific post colonial experience mm -hmm. as a matter of fact which is reflected in its literature again mm -hmm. okay uh, in this context can we also place the canadian writer margaret atwood and the australian ad hope as post colonial writers of course you could mm -hmm. uh, though i i can't talk much about these writers mm -hmm. because i don't have much reading in these areas what i can say is that you know both ad hope and uh, margaret atwood do actually also uh, share this um, uh, hybrid uh, you know uh, urge to not just look at their own canadian native experience mm -hmm. i mean quote and quote native experience Uh, but also to write back to the center you know mm -hmm. because they, you know england is i mean so many ways much closer mm -hmm. to the experience of mm -hmm. these writers okay uh, not just because they are mm -hmm. only white but you know they also have very mm -hmm. deep uh, uh, relations connections with mm -hmm. uh, england uh, maybe not as much as india and other you know third mm -hmm. world countries do but certainly these are kind of uh, uh, first world relations mm -hmm. that have al always existed with right. uh, with with the, with the mother country england mm -hmm. okay Uh, now that the concept of post colonialism is clear so will you please tell us uh, what was the major influence on post colonial theory and who are the major thinkers who have greatly influenced post colonial thought michel foucault through edward said uh, jacques derrida through gayatri chakravarti spivak mm -hmm. uh, appear to be the main influences on post colonial mm -hmm. thinking uh, though these critics as well as homi baba draw their uh, uh, inspiration from a wide range mm -hmm. of thinkers from descartes to karl marx mm -hmm. uh, all the all the cri three critics that i have just mentioned have helped shape the notion of the post colonial as we know and discuss mm -hmm. it today uh, other early contributors to these areas are o menoni mm -hmm. uh, who draws an important literary parallel uh, his book for example is called Pro prospero and caliban mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, there is albert memmi mm -hmm. who uh, in his uh, uh, the colonizer and the colonized actually uh, draws parallels with uh, the colonial experience the uh, draws parallels between the colonial ex the colonial experience experience and uh, you know the holocaust experience for mm -hmm. example which is i think very interesting in in, in many ways which are not mm -hmm. many people have looked at that area 
the most important uh, of these early thinkers of course is uh, Franz Fanon mm. uh, who's uh, the wretched of the earth and uh, black skin white masks mm -hmm. uh, are considered to be the classic works uh, dealing with the psychology and consciousness of the self under colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be useful to record here also that uh, uh, Fanon's work is also much influenced by the French uh, psychoanalyst and thinker mm -hmm. uh, Jacques Lacan. Okay. Um, uh, so, after having uh, looked at uh, Foucault's influence on post-colonial theory, uh, sir, will you expand a little further and tell us something about uh, Foucault's view of power and how it has helped shape post-colonial theory? Uh, power, according to Foucault, is the relationship between two or more entities. Uh, <coughs> within the relationship, within this relationship actually, entities struggle mm -hmm. and uh, a maneuver for position and uh, you know advantage. So, for instance, uh, the capitalist owner and his fact and his uh, factory workers confront each other in the field of power uh, that con contains both opportunities and constraints for both the parties. As Foucault himself says, that power weakens and vacillates is in fact uh, mistaken. Power can retreat here, reorganize its forces, invest itself elsewhere, and so the battle continues. It, that is power, traverses and produces things, it induces pleasure, forms of knowledge, produces discourses. Knowledge plays an important part in these relationships. Power is a field uh, within which certain kinds of actions are allowed while others are not. That is, power is a term we give to a set of rules that govern our interaction with one another. Mm -hmm. But these rules and the overall game that produces uh, them must be invented before the field of power can be constructed. Uh, thus, knowledge has to be created before power can be exercised. Uh, thus, knowledge in this way is linked to power. It only assumes the authority of the truth that has the power to make itself true. Not necessarily the truth of knowledge uh, in its absolute sense, but of a discursive formation sustaining a regime of truth. As Foucault himself points out, nothing has any meaning outside discourse. So, Ngugi's Weep Not Child now has a new perspective if we place it in Foucault's view of power. Ngugi also talks about educating his uh, native people and how thereby they can gain freedom and power for themselves. Uh, but apart from this, uh, we are talking about post-colonial theory. Uh, and I think a study of post-colonial theory would be incomplete without referring to Edward Said and his monumental work, Orientalism. Will you please tell us what is the main argument of Said's Orientalism? Edward Said's Orientalism actually uh, borrows uh, the basic idea of discourse and power from Foucault. Mm -hmm. okay. The main argument of Orientalism, as Said uh, outlines it in his introduction to the, to the book, uh, is that European culture, and I quote uh, Said here, managed and produced the Orient mm -hmm. politically, sociologically, militarily, ideologically, scientifically and imaginatively during the post-enlightened period. The book also argues that European culture in fact gained in strength and identity by setting itself off against the Orient as a sort of surrogate and even underground self, as some sort of double that contains within itself both its positive self and the negative other. Mm -hmm. uh, what then, sir, is the significance of Said's uh, work, Orientalism? Uh, the significance of Said's Orientalism cannot be overstated, as a matter of fact. Uh, in one stroke, it brought uh, to the notice of people, uh, both academics and otherwise, uh, that Orientalism is not an uh, innocent and enthusiastic uh, discipline uh, that is interested only uh, in the noble uh, pursuit of knowledge but also that it is a blatant attempt mm -hmm. to create a powerful tool that can help oppress an entire people and their history. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, as Said himself um, has uh, said elsewhere, you know, European uh, Said's book actually helps us notice that, you know, uh, the, that European interest in Islam actually derived from the fear uh, of its being mon mono monotheistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, culturally and militarily mm -hmm. a formidable competitor to Christianity. Okay. The earliest scholars of Islam, as numerous historians have shown, were medieval polemicists, have, writing to ward of the threat of Muslim hordes 
and of apostasy. Okay. In one way or another that combination of fear and hostility uh, uh, has persisted to the present day both in scholarly mm -hmm. and non-scholarly attention uh, to, uh, to a phenomenon uh, where Islam is viewed as belonging to a part of the world, the Orient uh, contraposed imaginatively, geographically and historically against mm -hmm. Europe uh, and the West. And this has uh, helped uh, other uh, um, you know cr critics from Japan for example, mm -hmm. to, to uh, you know reassess their mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge that the West has created about Japan mm -hmm. for example, which now they are uh, calling it the Japanese Orientalism. Mm -hmm. okay? So, now they are studying help by Saeed's own mm -hmm. work um, looking back at how the knowledge about Japan mm -hmm. was created for example. Now, Chinese scholars yes. also are interested in uh, uh, looking at how knowledge about mm -hmm. China uh, was created and produced mm -hmm. by the West. Okay. And coming to Indian Orientalism? Indian Orientalism, yes. I mean, uh, interestingly, Saeed also talks about uh, Indian Orientalism in, in his other work, mm -hmm. Culture and Imperialism, where uh, he analyzes Kim in a very mm -hmm. interesting sort of a ma manner, where he shows that, you know, uh, Kim, uh, the white orphan child in India, shown to be a kind of a uh, leader mm -hmm. among uh, Indians. Okay. Whereas, the Indian as represented uh, by the Lama mm -hmm. is shown to be a completely a historical being, a person who is uh, 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 you know interested only in godliness. That is this, the stereotype mm -hmm. that Orientalism has created can be reflected, can be seen mm -hmm. uh, actually being at work in uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling's scheme. Uh, another writer who has influenced post-colonial theory is Gayatri Spivak. Uh, will you please tell us the main argument of Spivak's can the subaltern speak? The main argument as uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak and the subaltern speak uh, is that the colonized woman is doubly subjected uh, both by patriarchy and colonial forces and experiences a double effacement of herself and mm -hmm. voice. Uh, thus, for the muted native woman, the subaltern woman uh, as Spivak puts it, there is no space from which the subaltern sexed subject can speak. Uh, however, she rounds up the essay uh, interestingly by pointing out that once the subaltern speaks, she does not remain a subaltern anymore. This implies that the subaltern subject has entered the discursive power relations that Foucault has outlined and is now ready to confront uh, both her situation and that mm -hmm. of the oppressors, mm -hmm. just as you pointed mm -hmm. out happens in Ngugi's mm -hmm. book. And when the subaltern learns to speak and is able to voice uh, his or her views. Do things change for the subaltern for the better? Uh, there is no guarantee of that, <laughs> but certainly you know a consciousness of your oppressedness mm -hmm. or of the uh, state of oppression that you are placed in uh, helps you to create a resistance mm -hmm. against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is the important part mm -hmm. rather than you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean you might be better mm -hmm. off under an oppressor for all we know mm -hmm. without uh, really understanding that you have been oppressed mm -hmm. okay, and might even be happy with your oppressor. Uh, but then the matter of fact is then that uh, once you start resisting this mm -hmm. oppression, uh, then your uh, actual uh, let us say life begins mm -hmm. because then you start thinking about mm -hmm. uh, the various uh, you know things that have uh, that apply to you, mm -hmm. you know, the you then, I mean, it, it's, it's knowledge about your mm -hmm. own self, okay, it's knowledge about your own individuality, it's knowledge about, you know, own self and mm -hmm. being as a matter of fact. Well, that's a, again okay. a different issue altogether, which okay. we, we, we have to talk about in different, okay. uh, uh, I think, uh, lesson as okay. a matter of fact. Uh, uh, Spivak's feminism appears to have influenced her article, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, can we also uh, look at the Dalit literature, at protest literature? And how and see how the same issue that Spivak is talking about might be uh, used in this case in a study of Dalit literature, protest literature in general. Oppressor, the oppressed, and within the uh, community of the oppressed, there are other communities, the women or the disadvantaged sections who are further oppressed. That's what she is pointing out. By subaltern, she means that. Uh, she, mm -hmm. By subaltern, uh, again, as I've said, you know, subalternity uh, is a term which is first used by. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know uh, is, is, is a term which is used to refer to a, a lowest of the lower uh, army officer, mm -hmm. a petty mm -hmm. officer in the in the army, especially in the mm -hmm. British army. Uh, and uh, this term is used by Antonio Gramsci in his prison notebooks mm -hmm. uh, to denote uh, an economically poor uh, person or class. Uh, the term in this later uh, mm -hmm. sense is, is adapted by Ranajit Guha mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and, and the Subaltern Studies group which he started uh, to attempt a recovery of the history uh, that is lost in the maze of history mm -hmm. of the you know, powerful uh, and privileged especially mm -hmm. in, in relation to the history of the Indian freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, as I pointed out earlier, Spivak uses this term in her essay to describe the most disadvantaged, subjugated mm -hmm. and muted of all beings, uh, the subaltern mm -hmm. women. Okay. Um, uh, an example of just such a uh, being is to mm -hmm. be found in uh, uh, you know, Mahashweta Deva's story, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay, the breast giver, uh, which, uh, which is a story about how these women uh, lends her breast to feed the children mm -hmm. of a particular family and how ultimately this woman uh, you know her, her breast uh, begins becomes cancerous mm -hmm. and how the same woman who were once actually had been a part and parcel of the family giving milk mm -hmm. from her breast to the children of the family is now an outcast is now you know somebody who's mm -hmm. th thrown out of the family uh, so uh, Spivak herself translated this, this story from uh, the Bengali and uh, uh, another example of uh, subaltern movement could be the Rani of Sur Sirmur mm -hmm. uh, where you know sat, uh, where uh, Spivak is actually discussing the issue of Sati. Uh, Sati she is pointing out in this uh, uh, essay could be a choice made by the, by the woman herself mm -hmm. because you know uh, male patriarchy uh, does not allow the woman mm -hmm. to actually choose her sati, she has to commit the sati, you know Indian male mm -hmm. patriarchy. Whereas, the colonial uh, mentality is uh, to save the woman from mm -hmm. this kind of horrible uh, you know practice. In between these two uh, double colonization, uh, what is forgotten is that the woman could also exercise her choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is the point that she is making mm -hmm. there, her agency mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that this agency is completely effaced, the, the fact that you know her voice is completely effaced is what makes her sub subaltern mm -hmm. because she cannot speak. Okay. Oh. So, subalternity then would refer to any person, class or group uh, who are which is so thoroughly disempowered uh, and exploited by oppressive uh, powerful imperial uh, political or social systems uh, that they cannot even mm -hmm. uh, speak for herself or themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. So, I, I hope that uh, uh, I throw some light. The, yes, uh, the term subalternity and what it suggests. Uh, sir, I have a question. Do you consider Saeed, Spivak and Baba to form the holy trinity of post-colonial theory? Uh, <laughs> they would, I suppose, themselves not uh, call, label themselves as post-colonial mm -hmm. in that strict sort of sense, you know. Uh, if there is anybody who is post-colonial, then it would be the uh, people who wrote uh, Empire Rides Back. Mm -hmm. okay? um, I think it was Helen Ashcroft. Tiffin, uh, Ashley Ash Croft, B uh, Ashcroft, Ashcroft, Bill Ashcroft and uh, Gareth Griffiths and somebody else if I don't remember the name. These are the people who actually uh, have uh, brought the term post-colonial to the notice of people. Mm -hmm for whatever good or bad, you know. Uh, they write interestingly the post-colonial with a hyphen, whereas mm -hmm. the post-colonial used by Spivak, I have noticed at least, uh, is without a hyphen. Mm -hmm. So, they write the story again mm -hmm. and a different mm -hmm. story again. Uh, but nonetheless, there have been problems with, a uh, lot of problems with, uh, the, the, with the notion of the post-colonial mm -hmm. as expounded by Bill Ashcroft mm -hmm. and you know others in Empire at SPAC. So, uh, what are the ch challenges that face post-colonial theory today? Is it the same as it was a little earlier when it was uh, when it was introduced with a bang and everybody fell for the term and fell for the theory or have there been criticism or uh, any other different point of view? I do not know, I mean uh, whether it was you know big bang, you know either <laughs> big bang theory, I do not know if it works in relation to the post-colonial theory mm -hmm. here. But you know the work of Edward Said and Spivak and Homi Bhabha mm -hmm. for example, did uh, you know excite many people mm -hmm. okay this was giving them a new direction you know 
to write about mm -hmm. uh, you know their own experiences mm -hmm. for example this was you know a, a good shorthand mm -hmm. to write about um, uh, so many issues that were concerning mm -hmm. them and uh, you know the, all those people thought that they now had a way mm -hmm. to deal with these things but in empire rights back i mean is it's a mm -hmm. academicizing of the term post colonial that book is meant for uh, mm -hmm. college and university study so that was what you know mis mostly mm -hmm. the objection is about that book however uh, in recent times uh, the entire idea about the post colonial theory has also come under uh, fire from different quarters mm -hmm. uh, these criticisms uh, have stemmed from an examination of the uh, politics of the post colonial theory mm -hmm. Uh, which as your lesson has points out has been looked at with suspicion by people like Ajaz Ahmed, mm -hmm. uh, Arif Derlik, Anthony Quaim Paya uh, and others. These critics rightly point out that most post-colonial critics uh, live and work mm -hmm. uh, within a western met metropolitan uh, academic setting and uh, hardly if ever are closer to realities of the mm -hmm. world that they write about. Okay. Uh, critics like Benita Perry uh, mm -hmm. question the politics of a critical theory uh, that privileges uh, the uh, the hybrid position mm -hmm. okay uh, that eternally writing back position mm -hmm. okay uh, as the primary form of uh, uh, social discourse mm -hmm. which i mean uh, here uh, discourse is is uh, you know overriding for mm -hmm. benita mm -hmm. perry you know the problem with postcolonial theory is that discourse covers everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, they as though there is nothing else beyond mm -hmm. discourse, you know, in the postcolonial mm -hmm. experience. So she implies, you know, as actually mm -hmm. Empire Rights Back points out, that these models that stress to uh, inscribe the in inescapability of the mm -hmm. discourse, uh, which constitutes the colonizer and the postcolonized, mm -hmm. uh, who are inevitably bound up in writing back to each mm -hmm. other, are in fact only a sophisticated mask. Uh, over the face of a continued neo-colonial domination, as he says, you know, very strong mm -hmm. words. Most recently, uh, Theory's Empire, that new book that has mm -hmm. come out, uh, has again challenged the assumptions of post-colonial theory and claims that major figures uh, in post-colonial theory, that is like uh, uh, epitomized by Spivak, Said mm -hmm. and Baba, mm -hmm. argue uh, only uh, through epigrammatic generalizations mm -hmm. uh, than through empirical evidence. Uh, or strong historical uh, grounding. Uh, in this respect, I think in the light of these challenges, mm -hmm. post-colonial theory perhaps now is in need of overhaul. Mm -hmm. okay. It should perhaps rethink its location uh, in the metropolitan center and perhaps also desist from riding its hobby horse mm -hmm. of high theory. Uh, one of the ways that uh, post-colonial theory could be more uh, meaningful is suggested by Spivak's activist interventions mm -hmm. uh, in many issues in Bengal and other places. We had a very enlightening talk today on post-colonial theory, starting by understanding what post-colonialism is, uh, by looking at the notion of hybridity. We've moved on to look at the major influences on post-colonial theory. We talked about the major thinkers who have influenced post-colonial theory. We've also looked at the major contributors to post-colonial theory. We have talked about Edward Said, his monumental work and his contribution to post-colonialism. We have also looked at uh, Gayatri Spivak and uh, can the subaltern speak. We looked at uh, the meaning of subalternity. We have seen uh, how uh, Said, Spivak and Baba can be um, considered the holy trinity or not. Pro Professor Mujibuddin beg to differ. Uh, we have also looked at the challenges facing post-colonial theory today. After having listened to the talk, I am sure our students of MA English are now confident enough to take on any question on post-colonial theory. Uh, I thank Professor Mujibuddin for sparing uh, your valuable time and being with us. It was indeed a very good experience to talk to you on post-colonial theory and we look forward to many more such sessions with you. Thank you very thank much. You.